Now that we know about slip systems, how would this apply to a big single crystal? If you had a big single crystal and you started to stress it, how is it going to start to deform? Well, one thing you'll learn is that um, dislocations move from shear stress. Shear stress members when you're sliding like this, that just occurs, the, the deformation is going to occur before things slide just regularly under, stress, under tension or compression. But what if you apply what you think is just regular old tension to this, right? You're applying a force normal to those faces, so there is no shear stress, you think. But remember, on some plane, on some arbitrary plane within your material, you can break this up into regular components of stress and shear components, right? So because there is a shear component, you could figure out the shear stress, and that might be what causes you to actually get slip occurring, right? So you can get slip occurring, say, in this direction, in that plane because there's some shear component there and we knew what these expressions were here's our two expressions for our shear component and our regular stress component it basically depends on uh, the angle of your plane right this plane has some arbitrary angle to the loading direction we call that phi and then you've got a an angle between the loading direction and the slip direction we call that lambda okay so if you know phi and you know lambda then you can figure out what is the resolved shear stress on that plane in that direction, okay? In fact, there exists something called the critical resolved shear stress, which is the maximum shear stress that your crystal can with, withstand before you get atoms sliding past one another like we did show here with the slip systems, okay? So if you go above the critical resolved shear stress, atoms start to slide past one another on that plane in your material, right? Now we know that um, phi and lambda they, at their largest, can be equal to 90 degrees, and they're typically less than 90 degrees, okay? The, max, or the minimum resolved shear stress will occur when lambda and phi are both equal to 45 degrees, right? You can see that mathematically. We're going to skip that for now. So this is what you actually have. If you start out with a single crystal like this, even though you're pulling a force on it that's normal to these faces like that, like that, what you'll end up getting is a bunch of bands occurring at funky angles, right? So your bands might, they are occurring at something at really unexpected directions. Overall, your material has gotten longer, right? You can see this extension where it's gotten longer, but it did so by doing a bunch of small slips along specific crystallographic directions, okay? So this is interesting. To do this, we need to figure, to do these sort of calculations, we're going to need to figure out what is phi and what is lambda? How do we calculate those based off of the directions in the crystal? Well, fortunately, in trigonometry, you learned how to do this. If you've got two vectors, vector A and vector B, we can figure out the angle between them using the dot product. We know that A dot B divided by the length of vector A multiplied by the length of vector B is equal to the cosine of the angle between those two vectors, right? So we're going to take advantage of that. And again, if you don't remember how to do a dot product, I've got it written out here in the notes. But it's pretty straightforward. You just multiply the terms of the two vectors together, right? And then the length of the vector is just you square each of the terms and you add them up, take the square root. That's how you get the dot product and the length of those. And that allows us to do this example problem. So let's put this all together with this example. It says, determine the tensile stress that is applied along the 110 direction of a silver crystal to cause slip on this slip system, you're going to be on the 111 plane in the 011 direction, okay? It says the critical resolved shear stress for this crystal is 6 megapascals. All right, so let's do this one. We know that the critical resolved shear stress is equal to what? Let's go back up here. The formula was as follows. The stress that you apply to the crystal, that sigma, times the cosine of those two angles, right? So this will be the stress that you're applying to the crystal times cosine of, uh, not theta, but phi, and the cosine of lambda. So how do we define phi and lambda again? Well, you've got your loading direction. You've got the normal to the plane, right? And then you've got your slip direction. So we said that this angle between the normal to the plane and the loading direction was phi and the angle between the loading direction and the slip direction is lambda. 
Okay, so there's our load, the normal to our plane, and the slip direction labeled. Now, what were those? The slip direction we know is a 011 direction. The loading direction we're told is a 110 direction. And the plane is a 111 plane. In a cubic system, and this is important, only in cubic systems, the direction normal to that plane is the same as the plane. So we're going to use square brackets because it is now a direction. If the plane was round brackets, 111, then the direction normal to it is also 111. That only works for the cubic system. In other systems, you have to do some nasty um, vector algebra, but it's not too bad. Okay? All right, so now we're ready to go ahead and do this. So let's figure out the dot product between those. We want cosine phi. So cosine of phi is going to be, again, the dot product between 110 and 111. So let's dot those together. So the dot product will be equal to 1 times 1 plus 1 times 1 plus 1 times 0. Okay? Now we need to take the length of those. That's going to be the length. We're going to take the square root of 1 squared plus 1 squared plus 1 squared. Okay, multiplied by the length of the other vector, which is just going to be 1 squared plus 1 squared plus 0 squared. So 1 plus plus 1 squared. All right. I find this to be equal to 2 divided by square root of 6. Okay. Now let's do the same thing for lambda. We need to figure out the cosine of lambda. The cosine of lambda. By the way, you notice we don't actually have to solve for lambda and theta because the equation asks for cosine of theta and cosine of, of lambda. So you don't actually have to solve for the, vari the actual angle in degrees. You don't need it. You just need the cosine of the angle in degree, which is what we've got right here. For lambda, the dot product is now going to be 1 times 0 plus 1 times 1 plus 0 times 1. 1 times 0 plus 1 times 1 plus 0 times 1. And then the length of those vectors, they're both 1 squared plus 1 squared. So I get that that's 1 over root 4. Okay. So let's go ahead and uh, finally solve for this. If the critical resolve shear stress, 6 megapascals, we want to solve for the stress that will cause this thing to start slipping. It's going to be sigma multiplied by 2 over root 6 multiplied by 1 over root 4. Taking those to the other side, Dividing both sides by these two terms, I find that the stress necessary to get this to start slipping is going to be 14.7 megapascals. So that's an example of how you can use uh, slip in single crystals to figure out uh, the stress that will cause these things to start forming these bands in a single crystalline material. Now this only works for single crystalline materials. As soon as you get to polycrystalline materials, they behave differently because it's not like you have one crystallographic planing material. You have lots and lots and lots because every grain is oriented differently. But in a single crystalline materials, you can do these sort of calculations. Now, slipping isn't the only way that single crystals can deform. You can also get deformation via twinning. So here's an example of a crystal, right? In this crystal, this was the original lattice shown right here. And these dotted lines represent the original positions as well. Now, when a shear force is applied to this, you can see that all of these atoms can cooperatively move, right? They can all move a certain amount. And if they all move the same direction, then you can achieve this deformed grid. We know it's a twin because it's preserved the symmetry about this axis, right? This axis right here, we preserve symmetry. This atom is symmetrical with that one symmetrical with that one. So it's an actual twin boundary. But what this can achieve on the macro scale is the same sort of deformation that we saw before. But instead of involving slipping, right, like this, you create these twinned regions and then it can untwin to go back. Right? And now when would you expect to see this? You'd expect to see twinning in systems where you don't have lots of slip systems, right? Crystals that are HCP, for example, where we know that they have far fewer uh, systems slip systems are more likely to undergo twinning. This is also likely at lower temperatures or high load rates, right? 
There's a really cool example uh, demo video, which I'll link to in our next video, where you can see tin crying, where at low temperature, you can bend it and it creaks. But if you do it at high temperatures, it doesn't make any noise at all because it switches from one deformation mechanism, twinning, to dislocation motion at high temperatures, which is pretty cool.